Welcome to the Home Stretch with Adrian Durant, a podcast where we talk to amazing people, world champions, and Olympic medalists, and we talk about their experiences, the obstacles they've, they've overcome, and how they achieved success and greatness. So we can steal some tidbits from their stories. Today, we have another special guest, Olympic bronze medalist, Megan Tapper. Ooh, Welcome, Megan. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And, and Ashley? is uh, joining me today as my co-host once again. Thank you, Ashley, yes. for joining me, helping me out. Of course. <laughs> All right, before we get started, I have to go through your bio. It is pretty extensive, but um, Megan Tapper, AKA Megan Lion, AKA The Little Lion. I'm, I'm all these pretty cool, pretty cool nicknames. So The Little Lion, Tokyo Olympic bronze medalist in the 100 hurdles with a personal best of 1253. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the first Jamaican woman to win in the sprint hurdles at the Olympic yeah, Games. The, and in the Caribbean as well. That's a huge deal. The, you got to say that one more time. <laughs> say that one more time. You are, the, you are the first woman in the Caribbean to win a medal at the Olympic Games in the 100 hurdles. Ooh, we got to be blasting so your name. Now. We have to be blasting your name a little bit more, I think, <laughs> my opinion, because enough people don't know this. And you've been in the game for a while. It wasn't just, you know, you come out and win a medal. You were, you know, yeah. 2010 Carifta Games champion. And for the folks who listen to this podcast, we've had a bunch of Carifta folks on here, Aileen Bailey and a few other folks from the Caribbean. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And so if you're a Carifta Games champion, we already know that you're on the path to being one of the best. Um, yeah. 2010 Central American and Caribbean Games Junior Champion. You were a 2011 Carifta Silver Medalist, 2013 Carifta Champion, so picked up a bunch of medals. Uh, 2016 Olympic semifinalist, uh, semifinalist in the 2017 World Champs, uh, seventh of the 2018 Commonwealth Games, bronze medalist in the 2019 Pan Am Games, and you made the finals in the 2019 World Championship. And all of that to culminate in your bronze medal, which is which one of your big goals, getting that Olympic medal. So I was reading up on it. I love it. So yeah, don't break the medal. Don't break the medal. I know. Wait, the show oh, medal. I broke yes. my dog. It oh, fell on my dog. Oh, your dog is down there too. <laughs> She's on the ground. Did he drop the? And medal it on fell on. Dog? It fell on her, but it's super oh, no. heavy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Three to four pounds. Oh, wow. Oh, That's the real boy. deal. Hold on. Hold yeah, it up for us. Yeah. Hold it up for us for, for those who never will see one. A medal. Wow. That is big. Yes, it's mm -hmm. big and heavy and everything. Oh, man. That's that's exciting. Yes. Ooh, Put that beautiful. one a little closer. I know. Beautiful. Yes. We love it. There we go. There we go. Absolutely. And fun fact, the bronze medal is the only one that's actually real. Everything is also uh, plated. Oh, so that's straight bronze? That's straight bronze. Deal. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. I never knew that. Interesting fact. I here. didn't know either. We learn something <laughs> yeah. new every day. Cool. So, Megan, I just want to hear your story. How you got, because every, Olympic, every Olympian has a, a story, because you don't just end up at the Olympics, especially running for a country like Jamaica, you know, one of the premier track countries, one of the apexes of track. And so how did you get started? I know it's a big cultural thing in Jamaica, but how did you get started with track? Uh, my prep school coach, I think you guys would call that middle school. No, second. Oh, I don't remember what you guys call it. Maybe your <laughs> father. Oh, okay. Uh, but in grade one, my teacher, my PE teacher, physical, physical education teacher said that he wanted me to join the track team. Um, at that time, I was actually a gymnast preparing for the London 2012 Olympics. Oh. Early preparation, but still prepare, preparing. So my parents weren't too, wasn't too keen on me joining the track team because that's another distraction that we never needed. But I ended up loving track a lot and preferring it over gymnastics. And I kept on pressuring my parents to let me sign up. I mean, to let me fully switch to track and field. They weren't into it for the first couple of years, but after eight years of pressure, they finally <laughs> gave in. Yeah. And so you were so, so you were a gymnast first? Yeah. Dancer first, then gymnast. Yeah. Okay, okay. Always an athlete. 
And um, yes. and how many years were you doing um, gymnastics? I did gymnastics for about seven to 12, five, oh, six wow. years. Oh, wow. Oh, so you... wasn't eight then. No, it was definitely more. <laughs> so you were doing it that. Was definitely, yeah. So, so you were doing that for a good while and then you started doing track and you were kind of doing them at the same time for a little bit. Yes. yes okay. Yes. And your parents did not approve. Mm-mm. I mean, some... they supported, you know, they supported mm-hmm. 100%, but they, they wanted me to focus solely on gymnastics. Because that was your thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. And they could see the direct path to the Olympics with that. Well, you had a, yeah. such a long investment in it. So that makes sense. But you started yeah. to enjoy track. Yes, from the start, uh, track was always my love. Mm-hmm. And did you start it with the hurdles or did you go into another event when you went to track? No, yeah, so uh, they didn't have hurdles at the age that I started, but they had the sprints and they had long jump. So I was always a long jumper and a sprinter, basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. I won, in, they have something called prep champs. I know you guys heard of high school championships, the boys and girls champs in Jamaica. They have a prep school one as well. And I think I got the gold or silver there for long jump. So I wasn't too bad. <laughs> so you just, you were already good. You were, as soon as you got into it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I you, mean, definitely I had you definitely had hops if you were in the uh, gold medals for long jump. So you definitely had that power. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so at what point did you transition to primarily the hurdles? It was in high school when I realized that I had a really good start, but by 60 meters, everybody would would pass me. Um, And I was like, okay, I can't lose like this anymore. This is embarrassing. So I wanted to find an event that I could use or that used my strength uh, to, to to, to the fullest. And so... I knew my options were pole vault and tra- and hurdles. Pole vault wasn't really a thing in Jamaica as yet, so that was just scratched off as soon as it went on. But hurdles was uh, the next thing, and my, we had a solid hurdle team at my high school, and so I told my head coach that I wanted to start hurdling, and he's like, yeah, man, go, 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 go. <laughs> and that's how, that's how hurdles started for me. Okay. And so you got into the hurdles and apparently it clicked. How, how long until, because you, you won the long jump instantly. So how long until you were just the best hurdler? Uh, hmm. I think it took about the best hurdler. I was never like the best. <laughs> I was always somewhere around top five mm-hmm. in high school. So that would have been, I think it probably took me two years. Okay. Yeah. But I feel like my my physical, I was physically capable to do more, but the pressure of champs kind of got to me mentally. Mm. So that's what I feel. I could have done better, but because mm-hmm. of the pressure, I wasn't able to handle the pressure and all of that. that that's what I think threw me off a little for a while. But my second year or third year in doing hurdles is when... So I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if when you, you know, I know at some point it became a topic that, you know, when you look at the hurdle race, if I look from the start, you're maybe four inches shorter than the average hurdlers. So when you got involved, was there any um, question about that, you know, whether or not that would be an issue down the line? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Always. I, I remember before actually starting hurdles, because now that I'm thinking about it, it wasn't just oh, let me run and do hurdles. It was always, like how I always make decisions. I think about something and then I go to the people that I think um, are important to me to ask, okay, do you think this is a wise idea? What do you think about this? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? And so I remember going to a family member and saying to them, yeah, man, I'm going to start the hurdles and I'm going to be great and everything. And they're like, no, they're not going to be great. You're like, four feet how are you going to do hurdles I work with Usain Bolt and or close or I know them and whatever and you definitely don't have what it takes and I'm like listen first of all I'm gonna prove you wrong (laughs) yeah 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 that was the start 
that was the start of like laying that fire inside of you. Yeah. And then also okay. in Jamaica, you know, you have Melaine Otley, you have a number of hurdles, Daniel Williams. The list goes on about the pedigree of hurdles in Jamaica. So how do you think that you approach separating yourself from them? And did you seek advice from any of the elders? I mean, it, it's never about separating myself from anybody. It's always about just improving Megan because that's that's the great thing with track and field. There's one lane that you have to care about. You know, you only have to care about yourself. You can't determine what anybody does. You just have to focus on you. And so that's what my focus always is, me being better and getting better. I'm always consulting the the not the elders not the elders the veterans the vets the you know veterans. the vets yes 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 i'm always consulting the veterans the call names no one forget somebody is going to be not the best things so i won't call any names but y'all know yourselves and i'm really really grateful for all the input and advice and you know constant support that you guys give me it's obviously invaluable Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask you for the list of people because I don't want you to forget one person and everyone gets mad at you. But I noticed there's always that one person in these stories that's just the, the backbone of support. Um, do you have that one? Is that is there a one person that you're willing to? Oh, no. No, it's no I have a, it's a I community. Have a whole community. Uh, that's, that's, that's special. That's special. Yeah, no, it takes a team. It takes a team and you need somebody for absolutely everything because as an athlete you you basically need one person to be one leg one person to be the other leg one person to help you lift up your waist one person to help you lift up your back your head trust me <laughs> it is a very taxing sport and so the more support you have in my opinion is the, the better the any opportunity the better it is for you to achieve in any opportunity in my mm-hmm. opinion yeah and even though you don't have that one specific person, do you have a piece of advice that resonates with you that you always go back to or you always think about? Well, I have a quote that sits in my mind. It's my favorite quote because I feel like it spoke spoke directly to me when I heard it. It was in a movie. Uh, Alan, it was from Alan Turing and it was in the imitation game. He said... It is the person who no one expects anything of who do the things that no one expects. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was, I knew that I had the capabilities to do great things, but it just wasn't coming to fruition when it was supposed to come to fruition, you know? And so I was like, no one expects me because I'm short. Yes, I have heart, but heart can carry so much and no more. You know, I was not going into this Olympics. Somebody asked or somebody said to me that in order to medal, you'll have to run 12-5. And I'm like, first of all, races aren't run on paper. When nerves lick you, <laughs> city, uh, weather, weather situations, resources and, and different things. <laughs> you got to run the race. That's why you run the race. You have to run the race. And so um, saying beforehand that a specific time is necessary and I am not yet there at that time, that don't mean anything. You have to show up. You have to do. You have to get the job done. And that's kind of what I did. So that I'm saying that to say, you know, whatever it is that you put your mind to, anybody who is listening, don't let the naysayers deter you because it is the people who you don't expect that do the things that you never expect could be done. So just forge ahead, never mm-hmm. give up, and you'll get it done. Nice. Well, you almost have that, to have haters. Yeah. that's it. I mean, she started off with that. Her family member <laughs> told her that she couldn't do it, and then look. Bam. Boom, she, she showed up. <laughs> Yeah. And I think I love that quote. I think it really should be like the theme of this year and the theme of this whole breakout year. Do you consider this year a breakout year for you? I think 2019 was more of my breakout year. Okay. Because yeah, I ran my personal best like three, four times in that year. 
uh, I'll def- I definitely put myself on the map in 2019. Got a meet record in Europe. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was that was my breakout year, and that kind of gave me the confidence to uh, forge ahead and, and do what needed to be done. To, okay. Um, get to so, here. So as you talk about 2019, because I met you in 2016, so you already were on the map. You already, you know, went to the Olympics yeah. and everything. Yeah. So considering that 2019 was what you t- think as your breakthrough or what you consider your breakthrough year, what changed between 2018 and 2019 mentally for you? Okay, so 2018 was the worst season of my career completely. I There were many changes in my life and I wasn't able to adequately manage them big company. It's only... In hindsight, I realized the different changes. I wasn't aware of the changes, so I couldn't make the necessary adjustments when they needed to be adjusted. And I had to stop my, I to end my season early. I ended it in June and I just took out a month off. And I was depressed for a while. Like I was really, really sad and whatever because I don't like to be in that place. I want to travel, I want to, to run, I want to train. And so when I wasn't able to do that, it really affected me. But then and after talking with my husband, um just doing some introspection it made me realize how much I love track and field and how much I wanted to do it and how much I wanted to be great in it and so I kind of created a a little another a, a team kind of ish sort of and started training early started lifting early because I had a problem where I did gymnastics for so many years and gymnastics is arms focused. So my legs, like the muscle memory in my legs or whatever, weren't on or something like that. And so when I started to lift early, it kind of woke up my legs. And so for the rest of the season, I was able to squat what everybody else could squat. I wasn't able to do that before. Um, So I think doing all of that, the fact that 2018 was so bad, I started working with a mental coach as well, Mr. Wesley Morris. Um, and all of that coming together to me, that's what made 2019 such a good season for me. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a decision year. I always, we always get to this point where it's like, okay, you are already world-class, but to get mm-hmm. to that next level, to have that breakthrough, you had to make a decision and you had to take a whole lot of steps. So you, mm-hmm. you even someone as good as you had to make adjustments to get to that next level. Oh, and for sure. So it's, for it's sure. always a work in progress and there's always growth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I always like to hear that point that it's not just, you know, up. I was doing it and then it just happened. It's like, no, I was doing it. No. And then 20, you had to go through that rough 2018 year and make some adjustments. Listen, listen, 20, 20 21 in and of itself was a whole journey. Just, mm. just, just to like reiterate what you were saying, it's never a straight road. You're here, your goal is here. You have to go like this yeah. to get to your goal, which is here. Yeah. yeah. You know what's curious about, um, and I'm rewinding just a little bit. Um, you didn't, now correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't go to school in the US, did you? No, I didn't. Okay. Was there any pressure? Because, you know, this is always a debate, you know, sending Caribbean athletes to the U.S. And I competed in the U.S. I actually competed, uh, went, went to college in the U.S. as well. Um, was there any pressure to, uh, you know, to go to school in the U.S.? Well, my parents, once, I've, once I give them a well thought out plan, they're always supportive. And I'm, thank God I'm always able to give give them a well thought out plan but uh, my mentor at the time Emmett McCambry he went to school in the U.S. and so he knew that the opportunities there were vast and that I could benefit a lot from them and so he was kind of pushing me to go to school in the U.S. but at the time I wasn't getting the offers from the big colleges that I wanted you know what I mean I don't want to go because uh, my goal my goal has always been to be an Olympic champion, you know, mm-hmm. to be at the Olympics, to run at the Olympics. It was never really about academics or getting opportunities. It was for that Olympic medal. Mm-hmm. And so that is how I made my decision. And if I'm going to attend a school 
that has no one that has never been to the level that I want to go, I don't think that makes any sense, you know? So I made a decision that I thought would get me to the Olympics, the fastest, which was in Jamaica. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it paid off. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> Definitely. <laughs> the proof is in the, the medal for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so you, go ahead. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was, uh, I was, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a whole different topic, but I was looking at um, one of your interviews and I saw you and your coach, and I was like, wow, they seem to have a really good coach-athlete relationship. And then I was like, oh, wait a second, they're, they're married, <laughs> which, made a lot, which made a lot of sense. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about that because, you know, a, a, I know a lot of the success that you had um, this year was due to that coach-athlete relationship and, and a lot of the things that you worked out. And so, you know, I think as a coach, I'm always praising to the athletes, and every time a coach comes on, it's like, listen to your coach, you know, like, listen to the, follow the plan. It's going to come together. You know, don't, don't step on your own foot. Don't shoot yourself yes. in the foot, Ooh. you know, cause Ooh. a lot, and that'll happen a lot. You, 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 sometimes we have these relationships with our coaches where it's like, you're going against your coach, but every single thing your coach is doing is to help you get your goal. Yeah. They have no other intention. And so either they're capable of doing that and you should trust them or they're incapable of doing that and you should go somewhere else. But if you're going to work with this person, they got to follow that plan. And so I want to see if you could touch a little bit on that coach athlete relationship and how, you know, just what you've experienced in your Olympic path. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, 2021 was a huge journey. It was over some really, really rough terrain <laughs> the goal was always cloudy it was never from the season started in october so i started back in october and up until june 2021 the goal was extremely cloudy i was training i was putting in my all i was working hard but I wasn't seeing the results that I wanted to see. But even then, I ensured that I stuck to and I trusted the process. I trusted my coach and I trusted the divine. Because as you said, they have my best interest at heart. You ensure, your duty is to ensure that you entrust the best person who you feel and you have the facts to sh show that they want what you want. So that's the first thing. The second thing is trust them wholeheartedly because it, it all starts here. If you don't trust them here, then your body is not going to react the way you want it to react. So you have to trust them here first and then do it every day in training. Show that trust every day in training, listening to them, doing what they tell you to do. Yes, you give you input because you have to be, in my opinion, you have to be able to talk to your coach. You have to say, okay, coach, I'm feeling this. I feel this nigga there. And your coach listen to you and give you the best advice for that. But trusting them, as you said, I had to, I had to do that 100% this year because the results in training was not showing what I wanted it to show. But then it just started to click. <laughs> And at the end of the day, that's probably what my coach wanted. You know what I mean? That's probably what his intention was. But because I'm not a coach, I would know that. I just wanted to see results, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of trusting your coaches and um, just making sure that you have people around you who you know have the same goals as you. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to my husband and my coach, husband being my coach, my head coach, so I have two coaches. I have my husband and my head coach, which is Philip Onfray. Oh, break up. We froze. Yeah. We'll cut that piece out once it unfreezes. Back yet? No, still frozen. <laughs> this one looks like it's on the phone. Mm. 
there we go. There we Turn go. Camera. All right, almost. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh. And then um the the mic. There we go. All right. Okay. Now we're back. Um, don't worry, that's what editing is for. But the last thing we heard was your head coach and then your coach. Okay, so my head coach is Philip Unfried, who lives in Austria. Uh, when I decided I wanted him to be my coach, we had a problem because he lives in Austria, I live in Jamaica, and none of us can really travel to each other. You know, so we needed somebody in Jamaica to administer the program and to me. And my husband at the time and I were searching, but we couldn't find anybody who wanted to do it the way we wanted them to do it. And so Matthew, who was an athlete at the time, said he would stop training and coach me. And I was like, you sure? And he's like, yeah, man, I really believe that you have what it takes to be a champion. I mean, you already are a champion, but I really do think you have what it takes to be, to be better, to, you know, get all the achievements you want to achieve. So I will do that for you. Um, and so that's how Matthew ended up being my coach. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, you know, you got a real one there because he was supportive. For real? Yeah, very supportive. <laughs> yes. And he knows happy, happy wife, happy life. So, and he knows me, and he knows me better than anybody else. So to have somebody who knows me as a coach knows what's happening at home without me having to tell, and knows what's happening at training without me having to tell. Great. <laughs> yeah, because pulling that stuff out of athletes is like, oh my goodness, like pulling teeth. Like, hey, you look a little bit exactly. off. What's off? What's exactly. wrong? You didn't sleep. You don't think I should have known that you didn't sleep before we started practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to share any of that. He knows. And he's like, when I'm in the bed and I'm on my phone, he's like, Megan, what time is it? You need to go to bed for training tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> I like it. See, that's why you have a yeah. medal. Y'all hear this? <laughs> Coach at home, like, hey, bedtime. Bedtime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, is how, this is what it takes. Yeah. So. Wow. I do like that we, you know, again, all bubbly, but there was also some downtimes that I do want to touch on. So I want to go back to 2019, um, World Champs, and, you know, through the rounds, everything going good and everything, but talk about your finals race. Okay, so in the final, at that time, I have never been ready for a race. Like, I was 100% ready because I knew I was going to surprise people in that final. Uh, but as fate would have it, the divine wanted something different for me. And so something happened at the start. I wasn't able to recover. And unfortunately, I don't run a flat race. I run hurdles. So when I was trying to, with all the grief coursing through my body, me trying to hurdle as well wasn't working out. So I just gave up because I didn't want to not finish a finals race no I didn't want to have a mishap in the finals race and fall and injure myself as well because that would just be like a double whammy so I was like you know what let me just stop trying and let me just stop before I fall and yeah that was devastating I couldn't for for like a couple months I couldn't figure out what the lesson was in that experience because I didn't know why it happened there were so many things that I felt uh happened that weren't supposed to happen that I had no control over you know and so that's how I know that it was divinely done it wasn't just you know, it wasn't just, it was a mistakes of mine. It was divinely done. It was set up in that particular way so I could learn the lesson that I needed to learn and put myself on the right path to this bronze medal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, so for people who don't know, in 2019 at the Doha World Championships, Megan made the final, but it looked like, to me, it looked like you probably stumbled out the start and then trying to recover in a hurdles race. That's hard. Because you have 10 hurdles to get through and it's a rhythm race. So mentally, 
going through that. I know you were not trying to get hurt and you just wanted to give up, but what other mental things were going through your head? Because in 13 seconds, you, you'll be surprised how many things go through your head. Listen, I was devastated. I cried. Listen, you, there are pictures. I don't know if you guys want to add them in, <laughs> but there are pictures of me on the track face down. There is pictures of me like this in between the hurdles while everybody else is running to the line because it's like I couldn't believe what just happened. I was in shock. And then when the shock subsided, I cried. I cried. I cried. I couldn't stop crying. I cried all the way from the track to the warm up track. And that's about a 10 minute walk. When I went into the call room, the people were looking at me like I was crazy because I was not just crying bawling (laughs) because listen when you're ready for something and you feel like the opportunity was unfairly taken it's a whole another level of grief a whole another level and so yeah that's that's what I felt yeah and that's like what you worked on that whole entire year because that's the world championships it's not like a race it's world champs in October it was in October so we had like a whole for those of you who don't know or who don't know the track and field season it usually ends in early September right Mm -hmm. so we were literally training for an extra month just for me to go into the final to mess it up oh it was devastating that was a hard one to to bounce back from Mm -hmm. yeah and you had already started work, working with your mental coach. So what were some things that you guys talked about? Because I know you said that you, at that moment, you couldn't see the lesson, but then yeah. talking through it with a mental coach, what were some things that he kind of pulled out? You know, to be honest, and he's going to be very upset at me. I don't recall talking to him about this situation, you know. <laughs> oh, no, it, I didn't. I don't recall talking to him like right after it happened because sometimes I kind of don't want to deal with it, you know, mm-hmm. as soon as it happens. That's bad because once you deal with it, you get rid of it and you can move forward. Don't try to stay in it. But sometimes I do stay in it. Uh, however, I had this year, 2021, I've gotten a couple lane eights that were lane nines that were pretty significant and I asked him to work with me on letting go of the fear that was associated with lane nine because the last time I got lane nine in a big championship I made a mess of it you know and so I didn't want any lingering feelings or anything like that to be there in the national trials when I got lane nine and in the Olympics when I got lane nine so we worked on the fear before those races Okay, so while he regathers, but okay, so acknowledging the fear, I think that's an important lesson that we can learn and it was a, it's a takeaway because some people like to block it out. And yeah. one thing that you did bring up is that it's good to acknowledge it, mm-hmm. deal with it, and then work on ways to just erase it. So once you acknowledge yeah. it, what are some yeah. things that you tell yourself? So sometimes you have fear and he goes, he tells you to go back to when you think it's the first time you've ever felt fear. And then you would basically change that experience into a positive learning one. And so when you come back to know, you think of all the positive learnings that you got from that system that he did with you. And then if you feel that same way going on in life, you just remember, okay, I don't need to be scared of it because this is what I learned from that. And that this is how that situation helped me to be. Yeah, I love that. I think it's important just like, cause it could transfer to any other thing other than sports. Yeah, and just like acknowledging sure. that fear and then working on ways that to conquer it yes. is important. Yes, it's very, 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 very important. Like Dave Chappelle said, I feel anxiety all the time. He says he feels, and I'm like, Dave Chappelle, why they're here? And they don't let the anxiety, they don't let the fear, they don't let anything stop them from walking in their truth and doing what they're supposed to do, you know? So I kind of think whenever whenever anxiety 
is 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 kind of attacking me or feel like it wants to become overwhelming um feels like it wants to be overwhelming i just remind myself if dave chapel can do what he does with crippling anxiety i can do what i do with my anxiety so mm-hmm. that's a, that's an excellent point and you know i think that just like with what it takes to win a race or you know what it takes to be you know the only Caribbean hur- <laughs> hurdler in the sprint hurdles to win a medal ever, which is big. We need to talk about that more. Oh. But um, I think that most people, when they see you know someone win a medal, they think it comes easy for that person. Um, you know, and I, I think I heard a quote once. It was talking about courage. It was like it's not you know acting in the absence of fear is what you do when you are afraid it's being able to work through that and still do the things that you know make you afraid and so it's not that you know Dave Chappelle or other athletes aren't don't experience anxiety but they learn how to master their thoughts they practice discipline they learn how to still you know carry out their routine that they've rehearsed a million times and kind of block block out those things and kind of get locked in and I saw, I yeah. saw something that you said about um, when you got third, when you crossed the line, you had no clue what place you came in. It was yeah. like you were just in your lane, locked in, executing your race. And you were just staring yeah. at the screen like, what, what, what place did I get? I don't know. Yeah. And so for that, you know, for those 12 and a half seconds, you were just locked in and, you know, not worrying about your fears and anxieties and, and blockers and the naysayers and anything else that you know, could paralyze you. Yeah, so. no, it was all about the execution. Because right mm-hmm. before my husband said to me, don't pay attention to anybody around you. Just focus on your race. And for some reason, that's what stuck in my head. And I just focused on me the entire time. Usually I could tell you most things that happen in a race with other hurdlers, with other hurdlers. And I can tell you, how we cross the finish line everything but for that race that particular race I was so zoned in and just trying to get to that finish line I never saw anything it was crazy man shout out to the coaches the un- unsung heroes I want you all to hear what this this Olympic bronze medalist just said like just that one statement and that's the thing that coaches do that people underestimate sometimes it's saying just the right thing at just the right moment and not saying it too soon not not saying it. it's like you're just waiting and you're seeing it you're like hey hey just execute your race you're like oh yeah why didn't I think about that <laughs> let me yes, just exactly. let me just do that <laughs> yep 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 sometimes <laughs> it's the simplest of things that you know already but just no that already. reminder in that particular moment golden yep oh man i love it so your next big goal well it was your goal anyway but you got the bronze but you are not satisfied until you are the gold medalist and the champ i mean i have that's the thing i am a firm believer in (laughs) my dog snuggling up beside my (laughs) my tripod (laughs) but i'm a firm believer in focusing on you races aren't run on paper but you can kind of see where track and field hurdles is going and you know that okay you need to be running a particular time to actually have a chance to medal in any top event and so what my goal really is is just for Megan to get better Megan to get faster Megan to get more efficient or effective over the hurdle because at the end of the day that's the only thing I can control it makes no sense I focus on anybody else because I can't go to their, go to their training and stop them from training or you know what I mean so I might as well control my controllables lessen my anxiety with everything else and just get better mm-hmm. yeah yep well said and now that Thank the you. gold the bronze medal is here you happen and how has your life changed uh well I have people like you knocking on my door I joke you were away <laughs> before you were before the Olympics, and that's why I definitely had to I had to come on the podcast. To the day ones. I, right. I always appreciate uh, the people who were there from the start because we all know success has many fathers. 
but the people who were there standing in the gap, people who were there supporting you when it, it, you needed it the most, those people are invaluable. And so I really want to thank you for noticing me and wanting me on your podcast even before I was an Olympic bronze medalist. <laughs> <laughs> you can say yeah. it with your chest, that's okay. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I feel like you still are still, I feel like even for you, you're still absorbing it. Like, yeah. Like it's been your goal for so long and you started out really yeah. well. And I feel like you had those kind of rough years where you're like, you know, seventh yeah. there and then yeah. bam, you come up and you get it even after such yeah. a crazy year. And I feel like yeah. you still haven't really like, you're the only woman ever out of the Caribbean to win a medal in the hundred hurdles. Do you know the, the, audience the crowd that you're a part of right now like the people whose na- the conversations like where your name belongs now it's it's i wouldn't say it's unbelievable because this is what we've worked for but when i look in the mirror i don't see how i look at a bronze medalist is not how i see myself when i look in the mirror you know what i mean so i'm still kind of absorbing like sometimes I just lay in bed and I'm like, wait, wait. <laughs> An Olympic bronze medalist, are you serious? Like, I have to remind myself, do you know how big that is? Yeah. <laughs> That's a big thing, you know? So it's, it's one step at a time. It hits me in waves. I'm not going to try to rush it or try to be different or, you know, just. No. But enjoy it before you go after the next goal, though, because I think that's one thing that we get caught up in sometimes, too. We're like, this is my goal, this is my goal, this is my goal. We get the goal, then it's like, okay, good, got it. Now my next goal, like, no, 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 come on. Like, this this is a lot, years, a lifetime of work and experience, you know, and it's like, I think it's good to stop for a second and be proud of what you accomplished, because it's amazing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then we hope that... We hope that with this podcast, you like you get your flowers, like people acknowledge um, the person that you are because they get to hear your story. And what gravitated to me, what gravitated me to you, especially for this podcast is like, yes, we talk to relentless athletes, but you truly had to relent. And this was even before I knew you even got the medal, but it's just like something about her is just like she about to do something big, like really and truly. And, you know, I got my little birdies or whatever. So I knew that you know, you during COVID, the lockdown and everything, you had to deal with a lot to continue on dealing with, um, to continue training uh, with everything that was um, forced against you. And do you want to touch on like some of the obstacles that you had to go over, get into that, that point? Well, I mean, just this year, my first track meet was in Lisa, Netherlands, where I don't know if you guys know her the time, but I ran 13, 7 for my first race. Granted, it was extremely cold and the the facilities were good, but it was extremely cold. I didn't have the necessary cold gear at the time because I was not expecting that kind of cold. Wait, so what's cold? Um, What's cold? I know you're Jamaican, so what's cold? 11 degrees with the rain. 11 degrees. Fahrenheit? We got uh, to convert Celsius, this Celsius, okay. for us Americans. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that's Converted. cold. Listen, plus I didn't have an indoor track to warm up on. I had to warm up in the rain, in the cold. Yes. So, and then that was a week after I had a very big fall in training where I think I dislocated my shoulder that's still injured, by the way. I still don't have a um, full range of movement in my shoulder. I cut the whole of my body were, were filled. The whole of my body was filled with cuts. You fell? And you were fall, You fell yeah, a couple times? Yeah. Before, like a week before that race, I fell. And so I didn't do hurdles for a whole week. So the day before the race was the first time in a week that I did hurdles. So imagine, I'm supposed to run on Saturday. Friday before. I fall, having a lot of nerve pain in my back, can hardly walk, deciding, okay, I'm not going to run. 
heart hurting because I was really looking forward to running 100 meters and getting my personal best down and I was in good form so I was really expectant decided not to run and then I have a race in Europe the next week fresh never run a race for the season yet in a brand new country I've never been to the Netherlands by myself my husband wasn't there my coach wasn't there my man my agent was there but you know she's not a coach you know so <laughs> It was really rough. Uh, however, when my team found out that I ran 13-7, no one was like, mm, or she's not good enough, or let's stop giving her attention, let's stop focusing on her. No, I never felt any different. We just laughed about it because at the end of the day, everybody knew that I was clearly capable of more. You know, they never blacklisted me because of one bad performance. And I really feel like that's really important. Because a lot of times we look down on people for different situations when we don't really know what's happening. You know what I mean? We, we, we say, we write them off quickly instead of looking at the whole, full situation. And so what they did is they looked at the whole situation and realized you haven't trained for a week. You were, it's the first race of the season. I'm always really panicky about the first race because I'm not sure what's going to happen, you know, because it's hurdles, and it's the first race. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that all of that was a part of why that race ended so badly. But that was a huge, uh, I wouldn't say turning point, but it was a huge eye-opener for me, because if people can support me through that very, very bad time, you know, the sky is really the limit. <laughs> Yeah. Outside of uh, your performances, I wanted to hear a little bit about the Tokyo Olympic experience because uh, you know it it was obviously delayed, and then it was it was kind of some controversy because they they were saying it was going to be canceled because of you know the spike in COVID, and um and I you know Ashley and I were at the 2016 games, and so my assumption was that it was just going to be really locked down and it wouldn't be the same experience. So um, I wanted to hear a little bit about your Olympics experience, um, your time in Tokyo and, and what you thought of it outside of, you know, com- com- actually competing and in, in okay. winning medals and whatnot. But, you know, as a visitor. Japan, Japan was amazing. It blew my mind. I mean, I was expecting that because I went to Yokohama for the World Relays in 2019 and I saw how amazing that was. So I'm like, yes, I am so ready for Japan. And they did not disappoint. Uh, I really feel like my my Olympic committee, the Jamaica Olympic committee that went ahead of us to the Olympics, and they we had a WhatsApp group where they would inform us of the different protocols and what's necessary, etc. So I didn't just I wasn't just dropped in haphazard trying to figure out everything. I was prepared from before I went to. Japan and so that took a real heavy load off my shoulders because I was able to panic when I was comfortable so that when I got there I would be comfortable if you get what I mean (laughs) uh yeah and so I could prepare (laughs) adequately Uh I think because it was my second Olympics as well I was able to prepare like a hundred percent so when I went to Rio I was really disappointed um because in Jamaica Olympics is huge. When you're watching Olympics on the TV, just even in your house, it is an event. You know, so I expected the Olympics itself to be an event. And as you would have known in Rio, that wasn't really the case. Um, It was kind of just trying to just find myself and, you know, uh, being comfortable and just at, at, at ease. But I was able to do that in Japan. They had... Uh, so many options in the food area so uh, many options that tasted amazing what if you were listen listen i went vegan for like four days and it was easy i didn't have to worry about you know what i mean there was always something that you could eat because they were just they had sushi every day mm-hmm. japanese food is good <laughs> Japanese food is listen, good. listen, they went all out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nah, that's good to hear. It was a, 
yeah and the trip from the village to the stadium breathtaking wow breathtaking it was a great experience a great experience yeah. even without spectators yeah i was wrong i was wrong about it everyone keeps saying it was great i i was like ah uh, you know but yeah. Yeah, I think the only thing we missed was the camaraderie, just to be able to move around freely. But I mean, food, food is good, <laughs> place is good. We had to run and then leave. So and then as I said, the preparation from before, the fact that we saw that there were cardboard beds before mm-hmm. we actually got there was a huge <laughs> thing because imagine you showing up to your room and seeing a cardboard bed. <laughs> so it was that would really just cardboard me. beds. Yeah. But well, I mean, did they were they like supportive? Could you get a good night? Yeah, sleep? yeah, yeah. Okay, see, so, you know, so it's yeah. all good. It just yeah. sounds worse than it is. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so you'll actually say it was better overall than Rio. For sure. Wow. Mm. I think because it was my second experience, as I said, I was able to be more prepared. Yeah. So I think that's what was really the biggest thing: the preparation. Mm-hmm. The preparation. Yeah. Okay. So, what is next? What's next for you? Well, I am on vacation now. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, break. I'm not training. Uh, so just relaxing and ensuring that I will be able to start training 100%. You probably don't even know how to not train. You're probably like, man. I, I Listen. Wanna... Yeah, exactly. Listen. Like, even when you said it, you're like, I'm just not training so that I can prepare <laughs> to train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my coach like after the after the diamond league the i was really upset <laughs> after the diamond league i was really upset because i wanted to achieve something that i didn't get to achieve and so i was like you know what cancel everything cancel vacation <laughs> i want to just prepare for next year because this is not gonna happen to me again but my coach is like listen to me you are going on vacation. You are going um, to, to, to relax because at the end of the day, you need the rest to rejuvenate yourself for next year, which is going to be hard. So just get your rest. <laughs> Shout out to my coaches again, my unsung <laughs> heroes who have oh, to convince boy. the athletes to even rest. Y'all wouldn't even think is a thing, right? It is a thing. Go to sleep. <laughs> Very important. Take Very a important. day off. <laughs> Okay, rest is Ooh, days go. off. Ooh. What? Like days off? What's that? Day off. What's after, that? Just go, just go for, do some light drills, go to the pool, take it easy. Uh, mm-hmm. I have to work on my block day? starts. <laughs> Can I do 10 hurdles, please? It's yes. just some, it's like some drills. Let me just hop over a couple. That's all I'm asking for. Something. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell me, you have any uh, unique hobbies outside of the track and field world? Or interest? Uh, I, I am a motivational speaker. Makes so sense. Just in case you guys want somebody to speak at your event, you can a book bronze me. medalist, of course. <laughs> uh, hook it up. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a motivational speaker. So I love doing those. I love writing speeches. I love motivating and inspiring people. I spend a lot of time probably watching Netflix <laughs> when I'm when I'm traveling. But when I'm home, I'm pretty busy. What's your show? What's your show on Netflix? I have many shows. So right mm-hmm. now I'm watching Billions. Um, I was I'm watching the Kominsky Method. I don't know okay. you guys. I love that show. It's so cool. <laughs> um, cool in a quirky way. Uh, Peaky Blinders. I love Peaky Blinders. I don't know if you guys. Peaky nah, Blinders. That's a, that's a good show. A, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those guys. Those guys are gangsters in that show. No. Yeah, they don't it play. It starts slow. It starts slow. Yeah, yeah. It's a good show. They're real. It's a good show. Yeah. Oh, I look into that one then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Pretty, pretty good show. Yeah. And okay. then so, um, something you put on your Instagram, you're 5'1", but you have mm-hmm. seven foot dreams. So do you have, yeah. what's your dream outside of track that you oh. feel like you can do, focus on, not focus on totally, but you can start, you know, putting it into fruition? I don't want to say because my dreams are, listen, when I say seven foot dreams, I'm not joking. Come on. You they just are, got an Olympic medal. No, no. Exactly. Anything you no. say is. Is valid. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You're no, speaking just, it into existence. No, I 
I just keep that one to myself. Come on, come on. <laughs> listen, there's not, listen, there's not a lot of interviews of you <laughs> online, right? We want to get to know you. We want everyone to get to know you a little bit, you know, start saying your name a little more. No, not going to tell us. Say, I just, I am in the business of breaking barriers. Breaking <laughs> barriers. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a riddle. Don't tell us. Today. That's a riddle. <laughs> <laughs> you have well, to figure it out for yourselves. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. And then I'll come and I'll say, see? Told you. Okay. Yeah, hey, okay. yeah, that's cool. Come right on. Tell everybody. Yeah. As long as we solidify that the fact that whenever this does happen, she's agreed to come yeah, back. Yeah. So she don't it. get too big time, right? Like, you know, yeah. like, oh, I remember when I went on that podcast, when I first got my first medal, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, um, as I began to say, you know, we want to give you your flowers. And I didn't know you personally. You're, you're an amazing person. So I'm so proud of, like, what you accomplished this year. Because you deserve it. There's certain people that just Thank exude you. positivity. And despite whatever's going on, they continue to exude that press positivity. So it's great to see that you are walking in your glory and in your season. And I hope that it continues to relish. You continue to relish in it. Say it proudly because you worked for this. When people were doubting you, as you said, you yeah. started off the podcast saying people doubted you. So say you are an uh, Olympic bronze medalist proudly and you're the first Caribbean women woman to do that to accomplish that feat so first ever. You just need first ever so you should continue to walk and relish in your moment right now and you know thank you so much for like joining us really and yes absolutely no problem. appreciate it the thing is Jamaica actually is helping in me re reveling in the achievement because everywhere I go Pick up yourself. Pick up. You think yeah. you can hide behind your mask? Or something? <laughs> you know, and I forget. Like, people will be staring at me, and I'll be like, why is she staring at me? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I forget. I got a run right now, so they're going to know Woo! me, you know? <laughs> Man, I love how your culture really, like, loves track. Like, they big yeah. up track athletes. Like, when I ran there in the World Juniors, it was like people were hanging off the walls, hanging ah, off the yeah. gate, capacity, yeah. green hair, yeah. yellow hair everything like go yeah. all in you know yeah, that's jamaicans we are very extra <laughs> <laughs> hey well yeah. yo y'all out here doing your thing so it's it's earned y'all can do what y'all want yeah mm -hmm. out here thank dominating you. in the track you, world you, so you. you know representing thank the caribbean you. well mm -hmm. thank you so much one Megan? last thing before you go you gotta bust a rap oh <laughs> here we go put on the spot mm-hmm See if she got freestyle in, in there or something. No, 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 no. I am so far from being anything associated to an artist. <laughs> <laughs> that was a moment filled with a lot of adrenaline and happiness and a little, no. <laughs> We're not rapping today. She did a rap. Oh, boy. I missed it. But hopefully we get Ooh. the clip. And we could oh, put it man. in. Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. I mean, you know, you two be I'm trying to copyright strike, so I gotta see. I'll be apologizing for from before. It is kind of crazy. <laughs> I don't hey, know man. why. You had that energy. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was extremely excited and happy <laughs> and just filled with so much exhilaration. I just had to. <laughs> but yeah. Oh. Thank you, Thanks Megan. for having me, guys. It was great. A perfect example of not letting people tell you what you cannot do, telling you that your dreams are impossible. All that mm -hmm. stuff is nonsense. You make your goals and you pursue them. And Megan, you're a perfect example of that. Um, we appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us. And absolutely wish you all the best. And we'll be following and cheering on. Yes, thank sir. you so much. Thank Show you, thank me. you, thank you. And you can follow me. Oh, yeah, that's right. At yeah. Meg's Tap Team on Instagram and Twitter. That's Don't forget again. to press the follow. Follow me at Megs Tapped In. Mm -hmm. M E G S T A P P E D I N on Instagram and Twitter. Give her a follow, folks. Show your support. Give her a follow. You know, follow her journey and see what she's up to, breaking, continue to break in barriers. Uh huh. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what's next for her for sure. And Enjoy as your vacation, though. Try to get some rest. Yes. Go get to the beach. 
I've been. Eat something I've been, unhealthy. Eat some oxtail. I've, no, no, no. I've been. Yeah, there we go. Listen, I think I gained <laughs> 10, 10 pounds in a week and a half. Oh, That's Lord. Oh, boy. You got some I take off. Yeah, I take Folks. off and put on weight pretty easily. So Make sure you follow Megan. Give us a like and a subscribe and all that stuff if you're listening so we can have more great interviews with these amazing folks. Listen, they're giving us all the secrets. Listen to all this yeah. amazing motivational content. So give us a follow, subscribe, follow Megan, and yeah. Thank you. Follow thank the you Olympic again. bronze medalist. First yes. Caribbean woman to ever win a medal at the Olympics. Yes. Megan's taper. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. No problem. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.